you're asking for, is this an indication of how you value yourself and your business? It's not even about what the client's asking for. Is, oh, you know, I won't say. We, I wrote um, on LinkedIn about a lady who got she got she won two retainers that month, but she got the shortlist fee following month. But it equated to two retainers of fifteen thousand. That was thirty thousand, and then thirty thousand to the next one. So it was sixty thousand. She hadn't completed it. And I wrote a thing on um, on LinkedIn about it. I didn't give the name. I said to clients, just one. Da, da, da. Somebody came back. Another recruiter and said. 30,000, and she hasn't made a placement. No recruiter's worth that. What does that say about her? Mm. It was about her self-worth. Because yeah. some people would argue, I'm bloody worth that. It was, and that often goes on with the fee that you're asking for. It's about your own self-worth. Some people aren't here today because they don't believe they're worth the investment to be here today. That's what it's about. Really good point, Major. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. What have you learned, we learned? This? I think it is a bit more about the fees. Sorry, I was sort of new in the recruitment industry. Yes, okay. I'm, I'm an infant compared to most of the guys here. Mm. I've got two years into it, but my two years have been broken down from nine to eight, nine to ten months, for example. Mm -hmm. What I've built in those nine to ten months is like, wow, seriously? I could be doing much, much more yeah. if I gave the 110, 20% I want to give. And I think positioning is a key thing because talking to most of the guys here, I'm actually a next techie, I'm a, I'm a techie at heart, um, but with a service and sort of sales-led background. I can bring that in, and one, one thing I'm learning here today is positioning yourself as an expert in what you do, making your, like you said, a service. Yes, 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 so. Excellent, so excellent. Quite key. I, I've joked about this many times. I worked in IT, IT recruitment. When I did it, I couldn't spell IT. I swear, and I did IT directors, I had absolutely no idea. I worked for computer people, had a division called St. Martins, we did executive search. If I was competing against you, I, I, I honestly can't spell IT. And you would know what they're talking about, and I would just look at them, you know, whatever, <laughs> make a load of notes. And just before the day of the internet, you had to do a load of research just to understand what they, what they were saying. But think about that. Most recruiters, let's say in your case in IT, have no idea. And you're competing against them. Bizarre. I mean, I've talked to, spoke to many NEF recruiters out there who are top of what they are in IT, and I've spoken to them to sort of converse and pick up their brain and that. They go, Sandy, yeah, well, seriously. I go, yeah, but. I don't know how to get out there. Mm. I'm trying to learn. Obscurity, more. see? Mm. So you can be the most knowledgeable IT recruiter in the world, but if nobody's heard of you, mm. it counts for nothing. Thank you. Yeah, but you've come today. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think um, Drew's point on, on uh, looking for the pearls, um, yeah, I think it's, it's easy to get lost in the, in the detail. Um, and if you sort of just sort of try and identify, and I think it's very specific for all of our businesses, it's going to be very difficult what works, and it's about identifying what works for yourself mm. and keeping your eyes open for that. Mm. Um, and then uh, the, the other point was, uh, you know, putting putting the verdict before the evidence. You know, when you when you're trying to build trust, you know, I think it's too easy for us to try and you know, shout how good we are before we've actually sort of given any evidence as to why we are good. Most re most recruiters' website do that. Look at us. This is our mission statement. This is what we do. Yeah. So what? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What have you learned, The small steps. Small steps. Excellent. Thank you. Oh. Well, I relearned what a tosser means. <laughs> <laughs> I don't use that term. I, mean. Do you know? <laughs> I have to use it more. <laughs> but no. so, so, when you get back to Canada, you can say, you tosser. What's that mean? Oh, it's a term in the actually. Well, I can call somebody a wanker, and they don't even know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> Surely, they, they smile. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, but this, this point down here, this isn't relearn. I mean, this is, you know... It's simple, but you know what? You forget about things like this, and, and breaking it down into, um, like we do this, you know, twelve-week planning, right? So, so rather than plan for the year, and, and when we're going through our first quarter objectives, um, especially with Brent being an accountant, you know, it's so simple, you know, it's so much easier to break it down and show. I mean, when you look at that, I mean, you're looking at, uh, you know, ten thousand versus thirteen thousand. And then at the end of the day, you know, you're up, well, you know, over nearly, nearly 400,000. Yeah. You know, and it, when you break it down like that, if you, you if you just said to somebody, well, we want an increase from 300 to 698, yeah. you know, wow. But when you break it down like that, it's, uh, and it, it helps. So it's really, yeah, that's good. Excellent. Jess, I know it's a silly lesson, but what have you learned, Trina? Really um, probably more where I fit into the bigger business as a whole and mm -hmm. what I can do to help, obviously, increase this and right. increase awareness. And the step-by-step step how to improve business Excellent. from my point.
Excellent. Thanks, Jess. Lorna, what have you learned, relearned, discovered? I have realised that we've forgotten to market to our current client base. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've forgotten them. Yeah. We just expect them to just come yeah. back to us, but then actually they Why should they? Yeah. yeah, good point. Thank you. Paul, what are you? Oh, so I think this thing about self worth is so important because you've got to. What we found recently is clients have been trying to cut fees, particularly the large contingent clients for no reason. And um, when you walk away, and it is really scary to walk away, I think I probably didn't take the right attitude. I'd say the attitude that you've affronted me because I should take the attitude that I'm the best, and if you don't like it, it's tough. So I think I left. I, we just walked away from Zurich and um, they cut their fees. And with our main, you know, in the little niche we're working with, our main recruiter, but they still cut their fees. And the guy I deal with said, I haven't got the power to overcome that because it's a global decision. Um, and I sort of, I did write to him afterwards and said the problem is sales directors get sacked for not meeting growth targets and buyers get promoted for um, saving recruitment fees. <laughs> but it was too late. <laughs> I should have said that to yeah, before. Yeah, it's a really good point as well. So, um, yeah. The other thing I think you're going to go on to a lot is about the evidence, giving the evidence before you close the Stuck time. Stuck in the so evidence, yeah. So I think Excellent, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Okay, I think, I think um, well, like Paul said, I think reinforce, because for us, um, it was very difficult for us to walk away from that business. We've walked away from two sort of couple of clients in the last sort of couple of months. Both contingent, all the yeah. time. Yeah, and it was, it's very, you have to be brave. Paul's brave, I'm not very brave. <laughs> and I think it reinforced, you saying that reinforced that it was the right decision. Mm. We've just got to, you know, Go ahead and talk about it. Um, and the other thing is um, mastering marketing you know, and and always um, learning and developing. Mm. Yeah, we're going to cover that in more detail. And you need to be aware of the. This is a learning job, isn't it? Recruitment in itself, being a business owner. And you just need to be aware. We're going to cover it in a lot more detail of the company that you keep. Because it's a reflection of where you are now. We all cover that in due course. Apologies. What have you learned, relearned, and discovered? Yeah, I was mainly towards the um, fixing the obscurity problem. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and that marketing can help you fix that and gain trust. Um, yeah, and then also just asserting yourself, keep your fees where you want them to be. Thank you. Have I, 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 Uh, that definitely made a, a, a big impact. And um, just position yourself, um, the example that uh, the gentleman over there gave with the doctors and lawyers, mm -hmm. um, how to you know, win, retain the business. Yeah, excellent. So, what we're going to cover now is the uh, profitable business systems are, are, are built on systems. And we're going to share with you uh, the 10 things that you must do over the next 12 months to achieve your best year ever. This is what it's all about. And as we go along, you'll probably notice every now and then I'm, I'm mention, mentioning a book or books or whatever. And there's another book. For those that haven't read this, I would recommend this book. The book's called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Yeah, good. Uh, why Most Small Businesses Fail and What to Do About It. I'm going to give you an, an, an abridged version. But this is... Michael Gerber talks about having systems. And... Who was I talking? Yeah, well, actually, I won't mention that. I was talking to somebody last night, and they talked about their consultants not doing what they should be doing. And here's the thing. Think about it. If I gave you a recipe for baking a cake, and I said, here, mate, this recipe for the, for the ideal Victoria sponge, yeah? So if you follow these instructions, we kind of know the outcome. But if you respond to me and say, Terry, you know that recipe you said use three eggs? Well, I'm not going to use any eggs because, whatever reason, I, I, I don't eat eggs. It's fair to say that you can't expect the same results. That, that would be fair to say, yeah? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing on that. If you want the sponge cake that I've just given you that you really enjoy, but then you say, oh, I'm going to do it, Terry, but I'm not going to do it, you kind of get it's not going to work. But there's a system, there's a recipe that we know that works. And in Michael Gerber's book, he talks about why most of small businesses, and it's a very high percentage of small businesses, don't work. Because... And you don't need to share this with you, but think about why you set up in business. For some people, it was for freedom. For some people, um, 
I can't get a job. I can't get a job anywhere else. I might as well go off on my own. Um, and you set up in business with something in your head about, about what's going on, about what your business is going to be. And what Michael Gerber uh, discovered was that to be successful in business, it's not about being good at what you do. So to be successful in recruitment isn't about being the best recruiter, but it's to have a successful recruitment business is having the right systems. And the systems and processes in place that you can, you can put in place for, for running the recruitment business. And Michael Gerber talks about McDonald's. Wherever you, and we've got people from all over the world, so you go into McDonald's and you order burgers and fries, there's a process that they go through. So whether you want ice or not, and it could be minus 20 outside, so Paul, you're in Canada, so you know what cold is, you go into McDonald's, it's minus 20 outside, they're going to give you ice anyway. They're going to put the ice in before they put the Coke in. Every single store will do, do that. When you place your order, they will then look at you and they go, do you want regular or large? And they will just look at you and they will look, won't say anything else and they will wait for your response. Anywhere in the world, there's a process that they go through because they know that a percentage, about 70%, 50, sorry, 10 to 17% of those that they want to upsell to, for an additional, in the UK, it's about another 30 or 40p, will go, oh yeah, actually, I have large. That 30 or 40p is pure profit. But they've got a system in place. Now imagine you go and work for McDonald's, you go, you guys aren't doing bad in your chips and your burgers, but I want my chips a bit crisper, so I'm, I'm like, can you imagine the conversation? And, and I don't, I don't like ice in, in my drink, so I'm not going to put ice in. Can you imagine what McDonald's would say to me? Get out of here. We've got a system in place that we know that works. You go to McDonald's anywhere in the world. The only difference, if, I guess, if you go to, to Europe, rather than getting red sauce, you, you, you guys would probably get mayo. Yeah. But apart from that, anybody, anywhere in the world, it's a system that works. You need a system for generating lead. You need, if you've got a system, you go, right, if I do X, Y, and Z, on average, I'll get 15 leads a month. And you say to your consultants, for you that do X, Y, and Z, and you'll have 10 conversations with decision makers every single month. And I won't say, but someone was talking last night, oh, my guys won't do that. Well, you need to look at that. Because if it's your business, it's your rules. This is what you do if you work for me. Oh, I, 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 don't, know. I don't want to do that. I suggest you go and work somewhere else. You've got to make sure that you're in the asylum rather than the inmates. Does, does, that, does that make sense, yeah? yeah. And you... And you I, we have many conversations. Oh, yeah, but my, no, they don't want to do that. Bollocks! Your business, your rules. It's, it really is as simple as that. And if you say, I want you to wear your underwear on top of your head, just because I do, because it works, <laughs> okay? If you know it works, th th that's the system. Systems that rely on people are often flawed. So we're going to show you some systems where you're not so reliant on people. You want a system that's based on, 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 on technology because there's a predictability there. If you can put certain things in place, like I know you guys, for example, have done some pay-per-click campaigns, and we'll, we'll look at that a bit later on. You go, well, if I just set this campaign up, if I only get one lead a day, and, and, and it's not relying on, on, on a human being, I, I just set the campaign up, sure, I'm going to go and check it every now and then. You've got a system in place. You're getting leads on a Saturday and Sunday. Sorry, before we go, anything you want to, to add to that, mate? Yeah, what, what you see a lot in, in this, this uh, industry is, uh, and again, you may be in this place now, is like you, you meet recruitment coach runners who they grow to a certain level, like they work, they work hard, they work, they work really hard, grow to a certain level, then things just stop, right? They pass out, they hit a, a glass ceiling. It's not just in recruitment, it's in all businesses. But one of the main reasons that happens is that there's going to be a point where you can't, if your business is built on hard work, so especially for those of you who've been in the industry a bit longer where you, 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 you were sort of raised on cold calling, right? If your business is like relying on hard work, what happens is you get to a point where you can't actually work any harder. There's no man hours left in the day. You can't do anymore, so your business has stopped growing. So the way you get around that is look, you build systems. And, and when we talk about systems, we're talking about automated processes that happen in the background without you having to think, without you having to work hard. And there's two types of systems you can build. There's one where... It's, it's reliant on people, so again, we're going to talk about the, the 10 before 10 uh, over the course of two days. Um, Terry mentioned McDonald's there. These are sort of built on people. And it's not to say that you shouldn't have them, and, and they're great. The problem is, even when, um, when systems rely on people, what happens is 
it can be dependent on what mood the person is in. So for example, some of you here who are familiar with 7410, you know it works, right? You know it's a system that works, you know every time you do it, you make more money. But what will happen is, it's, it's, it's based on whether you feel like doing it that day, or whether you're motivated to do it at that moment. And that's you as the owner, let alone what your consultant might think. Right? Or maybe, they, maybe it's not even like they feel like it, maybe they're ill, maybe they're off, and then, or maybe you mentioned going on holiday, so, you, so things dip. Right? So when things are reliant on people, that's what can happen. So wherever you can, you want to build the systems based on technology. So no matter what mood you're in, no matter whether you're on holiday, ill, you've got leads coming in all the time. And this is another point of respect to that. If you rely on people, mm -hmm. and you've got consultants and they're good billers, and then they then leave you, you're stuffed. Oh, bloody hell, he was our top biller. And you're relying on that, that person to bring your billings in? And by the way, any of you got business and you're relying on your consultant, you've got a guy that's doing most of your billings, you're exposed. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And the other thing that Michael Gerber uh, talks about is that for a lot of businesses, they lack clarity. So you say to them, and it's a question I ask, and, and you don't need to verbalise this, hey, great, you've got a business. What will this business look like when it's finished? And there's, there's a puzzled look. Well, it's never finished. Well, you need to look at that for a start. If you've got a business you say it's never going to be finished, you need to look at that. Where are you going with this business? Where would it be at 12 months from now? A year from now? Ah, 12. <laughs> Two years from now. <laughs> it's a bit like getting into a cab. And you get into a taxi or a cab, and the driver says, yes, mate, where do you want to go? Because this is why I ask ta uh, taxi riders. This is why I ask business owners. Where will the business? And they go, well, I'll tell you where I don't want to be. I don't want to, or they say, I just want to survive. Well, good luck on that, because you'll just survive. <coughs> or you'll spend a lot of time telling me where you don't want to be. Well, I don't want a multi burner. That wasn't the question. Where are you going with the business? So you get into the cab, and the cab driver says, Yes, mate, where are you going? Well, I'll tell you where I don't want to go. I don't want to. He's got no interest. Tell me where. You can't get there unless you know where you're going. So get crystal clear. And he was amazed uh, when Michael uh, Gerber did his research that most businesses, they haven't got a final destination. Well, if you don't know where you're going, how will you know when you get there? But if you said, this is where we're going, this is where we want to be, and if you only said it, that we encourage you to do 12-month goals and 12-week goals, and we encourage you to break the 12-month goal in, into 12-week goals. And you go, this is where we're going to be in 12 weeks' time. We're crystal clear about it. So we want to build X, Y, Z. Okay. So, let's make these numbers. I want to build 100,000 over the next 12 weeks. Okay. What is it you need to do that if you were to do it, you would bill 100,000 over the next 12 weeks. Well, then you speak to some decision makers. How many decision makers would you need to speak to? How many business development meetings would you need to have? How many leads would you need to generate? How many proposals would you need to send out? You should have those numbers. Well, uh, again, we had a meeting and a, a guy came in and he said, yeah, when I, when I meet decision makers, 80% of them convert into clients. By the way, either he's very cheap or that's not true. because It doesn't add up. But he's, he's still struggling all, all, all the same. But if that was the case, and 80% of your business development meetings <coughs> convert into fee-paying clients, at least you know now what you need to do. But you need to know that number. You need to know where you're going. Let me just check in. Does that make sense? Yeah. And once you've got that clarity, it makes things easier. Client says, well, we only work on contingency and we're going to pay you 10%. Not with me, didn't it? Because my, my goal is I'm going to win four retainers, or whatever it is. But it makes your decision maker just that much easier. So get crystal clear about where you're going. You need to create what we call world order. So you guys with, uh, with consultants, if, if you're, one of your guys is off hill, or if you're not in the office, but probably a better example, you know exactly what they're doing at quarter to 12. You know exactly what they do between 9 and 10. You should be crystal clear. For you to achieve what you want to achieve, for the business to achieve what you want to do, there are certain things that you have to do. And the whole thing with, with, with marketing is that you make no assumptions. <coughs> You've heard the saying, assumption that assuming makes an ass of you and me. So we can't make any assumptions anything that we're doing. Especially, as most, for most of us, our assumptions will be based on emotions. We might, we might touch on that. 
People then say, ah, oh, but Terry, my business is different. We never get the guy we were talking to, what's in investment banking? And we encouraged him to do some Facebook marketing. And he went, I'm not doing Facebook. Investment bankers, these guys are sophisticated. They're not on Facebook. So I get that, Paul, but we're doing Facebook pay-per-click. There's no risk. If, if it bonds, it's not going to cost you anything. He gets most of his business now from Facebook. Make no assumptions. And a lot of this stuff you can, you can text anyway. They're not too sophisticated. If you're dealing at the top level, it's a chief executive of an investment bank, they've got the same emotional triggers as anybody else. Um, yeah, I'll do this now, actually. Can you all see that? That's um, Men's Health magazine. I like the fact you picked the one with me on the phone. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist it. <laughs> I'm only human. <laughs> Men's Health magazine is a, is a men's obviously fitness magazine. So a couple of things about this. First of all, just look at the headlines there. And I'm going to read some of them out. Uh, Swap fat for ripped is one of the headlines. Genius muscle hacks. Think about this. This is in the, on the shelves in the, in the bookshop. Fit guy. And what they're talking about is what you're going to get from the magazine. They're tapping into your emotions. They're not saying this is men's health. I believe it's an American publication and we were establishing blah, blah, blah and our mission statement is because you go into the shop, you don't care. A bloke looking at you thinking, yeah, I want uh, uh, 48 ways to boost testosterone. You want all those things. But they're tapping into your emotions. Our decisions, buying decisions, by the way, are made on emotions but we will then justify it with logic. Please make a note of that. All buying decisions are based on emotions but justified with logic. If you look at, um, I hope I can find one here very quickly, yes I can. In this magazine, there's a photograph here of a watch. Look at any watch ad in a magazine or in a jeweler's and you'll notice something about the time it shows. The face is always a smiling face because they did research on this and if they, let's see where the hands are, so it's symbolising a smiling face. When it was the other way down, a frown, cells declined. That's a fact. We make our decisions based on the emotions. We will justify it. So if anybody's just bought a car, what made you buy that car? Well, it's got that. And you'll give all the logical reasons. But your decisions were based on emotions initially. I mean, let me check in. Is this, is this all making sense? Yeah. yeah. It's a matter of style, not some substance. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, over the course of the two days, um, we're going to be sharing things with you about what works in terms of marketing. And you, and you may be tempted to think, oh, that won't work with my clients, that won't work in my market, whether it's to do with pricing, a particular method for generating leads. And, and, and yeah, just sort of want to hammer home the point that you, you're dealing with human beings, we all are, so it, it, it's not to say that it definitely will work, but... You, you can't assume. The rule is, look, you test it first, and then you, you make a decision based on the facts. Uh, there's no, you can't sort of assume anything. It needs to be based on what we know, based on the results that we get or don't get. Thank you. So we touched on this. No cold calling ever. You should only attempt, you should only be having conversations with what we call warm leads. You should never call a stranger begging for business, in a nutshell. Call somebody that knows you. Drew touched on this earlier. When you have enough warm leads, when you generate enough warm leads on, on a regular and consistent basis, you will never, ever, ever cold call a prospect again. Just, just, this is just for existing clients. I just want to check in. I haven't asked you this question, so you know, please don't. Do any of my existing clients actually cold call now? Just, just raise your hand if you do cold call. Yeah, so, sorry. Existing clients, sorry. My apologies. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's okay. But think about that. Raise your hand to the other guys. If, raise your hand if you do cold call. Look around the room. Raise your hand if you enjoy cold calling. <laughs> Ra <laughs> Raise your hand if the decision maker said, I enjoy getting cold calls from you guys. Is that the hiring manager said, I, I love getting these calls? Just raise your hand if anybody said, the hiring manager said that. And say that loud, but... <laughs> 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 they were thinking it, though. <laughs> you, you get the point, though. Go on, please, sir. How do you know they know you? 
That's how you do know. you know they know you? You know, you say never call someone you don't know. Okay, we're, we're going to show. We're going to come to that. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll 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 know. We talked to him about desperation. Cold calling. It reeks of desperation. It reeks of desperation. Yeah. Again, we mentioned the, the medical profession earlier. You will never get a phone call from your doctor trying to push push something onto you, right? You you like it's better to have your clients come to you rather than you going out desperately chasing them for so many reasons, but. Like for me, the big one is like you can dictate your prices better. You can negotiate better when they come to you instead. Before before you sell your services, you must know how much you're willing to pay to acquire a new customer. I know that we talked about the LTV, the lifetime value, and that the lowest I think it was thirty thousand lifetime value. So you've got a bit to play with there. In theory, I'm not advocating this. In theory, you could spend twenty nine thousand pounds because you kind of know you're going to get thirty thousand back. Um, yeah, yeah. And by the way, d don't do that, but you, you get the point. You know you're going to get a return a turning investment over a, a three, or three four, four year period. So what you're doing is with marketing, you're buying clients at a profit. Again, if I'm competing against Brad, and we're in exactly the same market and everything else, and Brad says to me, I'm not, I'm not going to invest any money in acquiring clients. And I get to hear of that and I say, well, good luck with that, because I'm going to invest thousands to get clients <coughs> to come to me. Who do you think is going to get the business? It's, a, it's kind of a no-brainer, isn't it? How, is, do we quote again with the how much does it cost you to deliver on each sale? These, these are just, just snowy numbers. And how much profit do you need to make? You, do you want to just take over me? Do you want to back in here? Just take Yeah, so again, I, I touched on this um, a second ago, but a prospect to that that finds you, or at, at least believes they found you, rather than one that you've gone out and hunted, it makes everything so much easier, they're easy, easier to sell to, right? So, like, one of the downsides of cold calling, from minute one, you sort of position yourself in completely the wrong way, right? Because you've, you've gone out and chased the customer, right? But if they've, if they've came to you, or they feel like they've found you, that's what effective marketing does, you can you can like really dictate the prices you want to charge because it, it positions you as rather than looking like a salesman, as everyone else is doing, you look like the doctor or the lawyer. Excellent. Let me just check it. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. And again, somebody was saying earlier about going to the doctor. The doctor prescribes the solution to your problem. That's what you want to be doing with your clients. Find out what their problem is. And they describe, prescribe, sorry, the solution to their, to their problem. You will dramatically increase your credibility as a salesperson, as a consultant, by authoring, speaking, and publishing quality content. Does anybody, uh, just raise your hand if you know of Nigella Lawson. Yeah? Oh, crack it, more than not. So, anybody in the room, what does Nigella Lawson do? Sure. She's a cook. Who said that? She's an author. She's an author. She's a cook. Yeah. She's a mother. She's a mother. Yeah. Politician's daughter. And she was Norwich football team or something. Is that the no, that's uh, Delia. 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 <laughs> Interesting. Well, Delia's good as well. So <laughs> <laughs> well, let's make a comparison between Delia and Nigella. Nigella is not a qualified chef. Think about that for a minute. She has programs and TV about cooking. Think about it for a second. The perception is that she's an expert. What has she done though to enhance her credibility? Anybody in here know this guy, Joe Wicks? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Uh, do you do, you know, know Joe Wicks? Yeah. So Joe Wicks is um, very popular with the ladies. Can't think why. <laughs> My wife's got the very popular. <laughs> Joe Wicks uh, does these uh, a, a, a real um, sensation on, on on YouTube, and he shows his quick uh, meals he can do, and it's all about fitness and health and everything. About 18 months ago, I went to see a dietitian in Northampton. We just got talking, we just shooting the breeze. Uh, She's giving me some advice and blah, blah, blah. And I said, uh, and she, we got to talk, I can't remember what we got talking about, but she mentioned Joe Wicks. And she goes, oh, I've got, I've got a meeting with him in a couple of weeks. I went, all right, why have you got a meeting with him? And she smiled. She said, he wants some nutritional advice. I went, does he really? <laughs> yeah, because he studied sports science, but he's written books on cooking. 
Think about that. He is not a qualified chef. <coughs> he studies sports science. Think about that. He has sold, literally, I'm going to get the figures here. Um, he's, a, he's a fitness coach and everything. I've just got some, what's in his um, He sold a million of these books on cooking. Positioning's the key to everything. Sorry, Brad, I'm going to compete against you again. <laughs> Am I going to win one? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the things that you, talk, you and I were talking about uh, last night was um, one of the areas that you want to get into is, and you've worked in it previously, and you talked about you worked in the... In fact, let me just check with you. Okay, you shared some stuff with me that, about what you get. So Brad worked in the legal sector a few years ago. And so much so that he'd be flown to New York to, and, he, and part of his role was pulling out teams from one legal, you know, and he worked with some of the, the blue chip organisations. At no time did anybody say to Brad, um, are you an expert? Do you know what you're doing? See, unbeknown to Brad, he'd position himself as the expert. Brad competed against the big boys, but he was getting the business. Because his position was, I'm the expert at this. Think about that. You all should be experiencing that. So again, we're talking, I think over Brexit, we're talking about the narrow, having a defined niche that you want to operate in, it's then easier to position yourself as the expert. So if there's anybody here that's a generous and I do anything, you know, from 20,000 to 200, you can't. You can't be an expert for everybody. So like Den, Den, you work within, within food production, that would be that, right, yeah? Food and drink manufacturing. Food and drink manufacturing. I'm on Den's uh, uh, mailing list. And... Den talks about the area that he's an expert in. Den sends out videos. Some of them, those adult ones, uh, we won't talk about them. <laughs> but seriously, he regularly sends out uh, videos talking about the problems that the food production and food and drink uh, area are having. He's positioned himself as an expert. He's sending out to clients. In fact, you're sending out to people that have never bought from you before. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. But here's what we know. You keep sending those videos, and you then call them, you go, hi, it's Den here, or Zoe, I know you're you, you and Zoe. Um, they're not going to go, Den who? No, it, 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 it works. It works. I mean, I, I, and I know how many calls I've got to make to get the lead. Listen to that. Say that again. So I know how many, so I know how many, call, I know how many calls I make to get a lead, and I know how many leads. So I know if I, if I actually even pick up the phone 150 times, I'll get one contract. So I know if I send out three campaigns, uh, three campaigns, I'll get one lead. If you can't measure it, you cannot manage it. You've got to know these numbers. There's a story of um, Paul McCartney and John Lennon, and they, uh, John Lennon apparently wanted to, um, he bought a new house and he wanted a swimming pool. And, he said, oh, I want it. and they said, it's gonna cost you a fortune. And he said, let's write a song to build a swimming pool. Think about that. Mm -hmm. I worked with a client in, um, in Australia and they had a tax bill what do we need to do to get to pay this tax bill? If you knew your numbers, like, like you want to go on holiday to, to wherever, and you want to go away for two months or whatever, but you know the numbers now, unless you know the numbers, you can't do any of this. Then knows how many times he has to pick up the floor to get to business, how many proposals he has to send out to get a contract. Take me back to my days when I used to go clubbing when I was 16, how many girls I would have to ask for a dance. <laughs> it's, 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 it's <laughs> Your ratios were poor back then. <laughs> but you don't give up there, do you? <laughs> I'm just on that. I often joke about this, some of the facts that I send out. Marketing is like dating. Regardless of your gender, you get in front of somebody and you're desperate. It's not attractive, is it? Not that any of us guys have ever been desperate. <laughs> Was that just me? <laughs> it's exactly the same. Going up to, a, to somebody that you've never met. Hi, how are you doing? Doesn't work, does it? But they <laughs> Explains a lot. But you see the point there? They've got to know you, like you, and trust you. It's exactly the same. And we often joke about it. Um, and so we're, we're serious about it. It is very much like dating. You've got to be disciplined to carry it out, though. That's the key thing, right? Yeah. Because that's what I find a lot of people don't want to do. 
Like as far as the criminals. Yeah, that's right. Like that's right. You're absolutely right. And they, they don't want to master it. And people say, oh, Reggie will be uh, I know you're uh, a Reggie book. Great. And what part have you implemented? Them? Oh, not yet, but I'm going to. They're not. <laughs> They're not. I think as well, like, the best thing about this now is, when you go back five years, ten years, to be able to do all this, you needed to be invited. Right? You needed to be... Someone needs to approach you to write a book, you need to be invited to speak. <coughs> now, you've, you've got your own platform, right? You've got, you mentioned YouTube, you've got blogging, you've got LinkedIn. <coughs> to, you've got your own platform to produce and put out this content for your clients to see it. So, you, you don't, you no longer need permission, even to, even to publish a book, you can, you can do it yourself if you want to. There's no, you don't need permission anymore to gain this credibility. You don't need to wait for your opportunity. You can go and do it yourself. Started today. Yeah, and don't feel guys. I'm talking to Gary, Mike, and we're talking about we're talking about doing webinars. And one thing you do at the beginning of the webinar, you say, "Who am I? Who am I worth listening to?" And these, so these guys have got eBooks uh, that they've already got now. One thing that we encourage you to do is to put those eBooks onto Amazon. I said to them, "It's not about the money. You'll put the eBook on Amazon, 99p. But when you're then presenting your webinar, they go, "Who are you?" Well, you you may have read some of my eBooks or reports on Amazon. They're available on Amazon. I'm competing against Ash. I've, I've beaten you hands down now, Brad. So I'm now competing against Ash, yeah? Seriously. And they say, well, I'm talking to Ash. And I say, have you read any of my books or reports on, on, on Amazon? I'm not another recruiter. Do you, do you remember we said about commoditizing there? How, and the client wants you to do that. And you say, no, no, no. I'd, well, I'm talking to Ash. Well, good luck with that. And all, sorry, all of this is evidence, right? So, again, Dennis with his videos. Every time he sends a video out, maybe three minutes long, he's just he's just demonstrating his expertise in a way that his competition hasn't done. So it's evidence. It's all helping him make the sale. Maybe not that day, but further on down the line, they're gonna they they now view Dennis as the expert because he's demonstrated that. Stacking the evidence. Given a small tip in a video. So we we, t so no, we, said, we said to, sorry. I was going to say. Uh, I think the other thing to consider on this point as well is that. With the systems and processes that are out there at the moment, all of this is measurable as well. So you can say, I've done this, I've got this kind of level of return, or I've got this level of interest. Yeah. That's good enough, or it's not good enough, so I'll dial it up or dial it down to, to suit. So I think, yeah, you know, all of this is, is brilliant stuff, and it is measurable and quantifiable, and you can uh, measure that return on yeah. investment. So I talk to guys and I say, look, why don't you do a video, two minute video, hi, it's Terry here and from at me and co executive search, just two quick two minute video, I want to share with the seven things you must never ask, ask in an interview. You can, and some guys go, oh, bloody hell, Terry, they know all this stuff. Don't make that assumption. You're the expert. Now you're thinking it's basic stuff. Don't ask them about their sexuality and, you know, whether they're married or planned out, all the basic stuff that we kind of take. A lot of hiring managers, as you well know, have never been taught how to interview. And they will ask. Tell me, sorry, no in this room. Tell me, sorry, um, uh, somebody went for a job, a lady went for a job with an accountant, a quite, a, quite a large accountant, and she was interviewed, and as they're walking back to the reception, it's just making small talk. Anyone, you've got any kids? And she went, no, no, no. no. She took them to court, she never got the job. And she said it's because of that. He did ask the question, but in all innocence. If you know, you wouldn't dream of asking that question. It's, you might think it's basic stuff, but position yourself as the expert given this, given this content. And here's the thing, people then say, well, who am I to be the expert? Who are you not to be? <coughs> if it's not you, it's going to be somebody else. And don't wait for somebody else to put the crown on your head. Yeah, Ali's a really good guy and you know, she's an expert here. Because everybody else says, no, it doesn't work like that. Look at my instruction, who's Terry Edwards? the world's leading marketer for recruitment to search firms. Who says, I say. <laughs> and that's all that matters. <laughs> but it's, do you get the point? <laughs> we have a uh, chat with John. And he's got, and I, I go on, he said, there are two types of people in the world. People that love me and people with very poor taste. And I think, <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the, to the, to the, um, the magazine I showed you, Men's Health. All clients care about themselves, their problems, and how to solve them. Men's Health are talking about solving, in this case, and look at any magazine, <coughs> about their problem. The moment you start talking about yourself, they, they've, they've lost interest. I, I know it sounds cruel, they're, they're not interested in you. 
Nobody actually wants to buy recruitment or search. George uses the example, if you go to a local DIY store and you want to drill a hole in the wall, so you've got one a quarter inch drill to drill a hole in the wall, you don't want the drill, you want the hole in the wall. If you could buy the hole, that solves your problem, that's what you want. Your clients don't want your search. They want a senior financial professional to solve their problem. That's what you want to be talking about. So you might notice an animals will say things like, are you a... Are you an owner or a director of an executive search firm um, or recruitment firm? I've got your attention. Are you sick and tired of making those endless cold calls to clients who no, val no longer value or respect what you do? I want it to resonate with you. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. I want to get your attention. Or I could say, hi, my name's Terry Edwards and I'm a fantastic marketeer and I, could, and I do this. You couldn't give a shit. You want your problem solved. What's the problem that you're solving? Sorry, Brad. Are you a, uh, sorry, are you a senior partner in, le in a legal firm looking to expand your team and to take your business to the next level and you're frustrated, unable to find the top candidates? Like, see what we're doing there? Yeah. You want them to go, or her to go, yeah. And that applies to all of you. Talk about their problem that you're going to solve, not about recruitment. Focus on their internal and external pain. I'll cover this up now. Again, I think I'll touch into there. As human beings, we're motivated by two things. To avoid pain and gain pleasure in everything that we do. And I'll just do a little... Do an exercise. I'll do it with you, Ali, yeah? So okay. just, just, just do it with you. I, I won't do it around the room. But just do it this way. Here we, here we go. Just like Ali, if I could help you overcome the number one challenge in your business right now, what would that be? Um, gain more clients. Gain more clients. Yeah. Okay, so that's Ali's problem, yeah? Next question. I'm curious. I mean, this is the last one, because it's short version. I'm curious, Ali, what's the implications for the business if you don't acquire more clients? Um, it won't grow. It won't grow? No. What's the implications to that if the business doesn't grow? Um, I can't. Um, I can't. I can't grow the business financially, I won't make more money. Um, I can't, I can't, yeah, I can't grow it. Okay, so you, you, can't, you can't make more money. Yeah. And on a purely personal level, Ali, what's the implications for you, for you on a personal level if you can't grow the business? I feel like I'll be stuck in the same situation. Stuck in the same situation? Yeah. What else? Um, the things I want to do with, with the, my time. So what sort of things do you want to do, Ali, Andrew? Travel more. You want to travel more, so you yeah. want to be able to travel as much as you'd like to? Yeah. Yeah? Um, yeah, a better house. A better house? Yeah. Um, just spend more time with friends and family. Right. So if I could show you a way of getting more clients, so you've got more time to spend with your family and you've got more money, I guess you'd be open to that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. What I've done with Anna, I've asked her a series of questions, I want to establish her pain. Her pain is not enough clients, and the implications of those pain. So going back to Brad, and, you know, and Brad's communicating to the legal <laughs> professionals, their pain is they want to grow their legal firms, but they haven't got the expertise in-house. And the implication of that pain is, for the, for the partner of, of, of legal firms, is they can't grow, they don't get market share. By the way, this applies to any of you guys, and whether it's you're in. Let me just check in. Is, is that making sense what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what you're going to tap into, their internal pain. And you're going to solve their internal pain. And you don't say, and I'm a great recruiter, I can solve all that. It's, it's almost like going from, it's almost like asking for sex on the first day. Every now and then you're going to get lucky. But you might say, well, actually, do you know what? Perhaps I can, I can give you a, a free ebook, or I can give you something to start this. Start, not in the dating, by the way. You don't give a free ebook. <laughs> <laughs> Mike says that doesn't work. Oh. <laughs> Right. <laughs> we have a sign in our office, a big sign says it just says telling is not selling, and we have like customer charts on the on the desks. And we all get frustrated when the client rings up or you ring the client, and the client says, "Well, how much does it cost?" Well, hang on, I haven't told you about the service. What we can do? What you know? We want to talk to you about your problems. 
No, I'm not interested. I've heard it all before, Adrian. How much does it cost? Do you know what we should do on that, by the way? It's price really. And then what we do is say, well, unfortunately, I don't think we're the right agency. Excellent. Brilliant. 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 And, and you'll be amazed how many say, okay, then, well, let's talk. That's right. That's right. You can't solve the problem. How much is it? Well, it could be a pound, it could be a minute. What's your problem? What's the problem that we need to solve? I may not even be the right person for you. That's a pretty stupid question to ask. If you're buying on price and price alone, I'm probably not the organisation for you. If you want the top candidates that are going to add to your bottom line and help you build the team so you can take your business to the next level, we can continue this conversation. If you want the cheapest candidates, I'll give the phone numbers for my main comp cheap competitors. You can go and talk to them. Do you see the difference in how you're positioning this? It's a, I, I do think it's a ridiculous question. Now, it's, it's context red, not everything, everything's the same. So, example, I think a lot of men did relate to this. I never ever wear out a pair of socks, but I always bloody lose them, yeah? So I have this thing about socks. I will always buy cheap socks. My wife goes, they're tacky. I don't care, because I always lose them, yeah? So it's always context re relevant. Um, it be it shoes, computers, some things you're going to think, yeah, I'll, I'll go for the cheapest. That's fine. Now, I'm not knocking, let's say, a warehouse operative driving the forklift truck, but it may not be a critical role from business. And they may go, do you know what? This is not a critical role, so yeah, I, I am buying on price. It will always be context relevant. But if you're recruiting a chief executive, a, a, a financial director, a compliance person, you really want the cheapest candidate? <laughs> is, is, is that, well, great, but I, it isn't me. If this role isn't critical for your business, if you don't think it's worth you making that investment for the best candidates, that's fine, but it's, it's not. Do you see what I'm saying here? You can't have good and cheap. That's right. What was that? You can't have good and cheap. You can have speed. Quality. Quality and price, but you can only have two, two of those, those three. Two of those three. Yeah. Speed, quality and price, but you can only have two of those three. You let me know. And if it is on price, it's, yeah. it's not me. Yeah. It works as well. Yeah. I think as well, just to add to what you said, Terry, like, digging into their internal pains is where you will make the sale. Like, and I mean, when, when you was asking Ali, you stopped at art. Uh, so Ali said, I want to spend more time with my family. You want to get to what's underneath that. So why is that important to you? And then you might find that uh, when Ali was growing up, for example, uh, her family wasn't around. And she, for her now, it's important that she's with her family. Or well, maybe it's, I'm worried that uh, my kids aren't going to, I'm not going to have a good relationship with my kids. So these are deeper levels that you want to get to. And sometimes you can get that by speaking to the client face to face, but a lot of the time in your marketing, because we're talking about from moment one you have to be doing this, you have to be doing it from moment one. You have to be, you have to know your clients inside out and know that, what, you need to know what their in deeper internal pains are. So like, we know most of our clients can have kids. So when we're selling this event, for example, we're not selling lead generation or lead generation alone. We're talking about growing a business to get more freedom so you can spend more time, literally pretty much exactly what Ali said, because that's what people are buying. So you need to get to the deeper level of what is it that your clients want? Is it promotion? Is it, what, what is it? We call it the why and all the kinds of words. One of the things we get you to do, we get you to de detail where you want to go in your business. You say, where are you going? And they go, blah, 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 blah. And they say, great, why? This is very personal, don't show this in the room now. What will achieving your goal give you that you don't believe you have now? Because that's what's really driving, it's the why underneath. So because you embark on this journey, every now and then, the shit's going to hit the fan. There's no other way of putting it. Stuff's going to happen. Brad uh, very kindly shared some of the challenges he had in, in his business. That's what that happens in business. If you've got a strong enough why, you've got the resilience. Guys that quit, by the way, haven't got a strong enough why. That's all. That's the biggest difference. It's not that important. But if I say to Brad, if you know the cheapest target, I'm going to, sorry about keeping you up, I'm going to blow your kneecaps off. He's got a strong enough why. Does that, does that make sense? So one of the things you, you know, that we, uh, with our with the clients that we work with, we're constantly getting you to, to, to look at your goal and what it is you want to achieve for your goal. What's your why? And again, working with other people, you know, I keep saying this is a lonely business. But if you're working with somebody who's helping you to focus on this all the time, what's your why? That's where your resist resilience comes from. When you have more leads you can handle, you have to pick and choose who you work with, which we can't really touch on. You should only work with clients who are willing to pay the fees. If any of you right now are working with clients who aren't paying the fees that you want, that was your choice, as we touched on earlier. 
You, sh you choose who you work with. Can I just inject? Uh, yes, please. One yeah. of the things that you said to me the other day that really struck home was that uh, you set the. Um, <coughs> I can't think how you explained to me. You remember when we were talking about um, <clears throat> um, you set your own level, your boundaries, like, like, like as far as, um, I'm just trying to think of the wording that you have there, where you, um, Was it? clients will only, you know, um, got a mental block here. Was it to do with pricing? Hmm? Was it to do with how much you charge? No, yeah, no, but, but it's the perception of what the clients think of you. Yeah. You, you, you have control of allowing, you, 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 you're in charge of allowing them uh, mm. to believe what you want to believe. Yeah. Right? Does that make sense? You know, yeah, because, yeah. I'm yeah. just trying, because it, it comes with a willing to pay for the fees. Uh, we talked about, um, um, <coughs> Oh, was it, I was, without saying too much, it's about the challenge you had with that client when there's a bit of a dispute. Yeah, but no, I'm just, it's just a generality that, that you set the tone and, and um, I'm just trying to think, well, it wasn't fees, it was, uh, but at the end of the day, it's about your clients, you're setting your own expectations or beliefs, right? And, and if they, if I want to, if I want to, like, just do... Um, chief financial officers as opposed to managers of finance. If I'm doing managers of finance all the time, um, I'm going to set that bar. You know what I mean? But if I just say I'm at CFOs, the oh, perception, okay. you know, I'm, it's, yeah. it's not, I'm yeah. a okay. hard time explaining yeah. it. But you so, know yeah, I remember that, yeah. So, because that relates to this. That's right. So, Paul was talking about example, we had an opportunity to do some work at a lower level than he normally works at. And he felt that perhaps he ought to do it because it was an existing client. And what I was saying was, if you start doing that, the perception is that that's what you do. Yeah. But you set the perception. That's okay. So if I say to Brad, sorry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so if I say to Dennis, Dennis, I want you to find me some scaffolders. Now you can either say, oh, this is a bit of business here. Or you can say, to him, I don't do scaffolders. And I don't work at that level. But if you say, okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do. My perception is that's what Dennis does. He does scaffolders at 20,000 or whatever they earn. That was a point of, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. But you decide that, not the client. The thing is, by doing that, and I've done it, when the more senior role comes up, they, 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 you're pigeonholed at whatever level. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. And I had a situation where I took, this is going back last year, I took on a job that was a £70,000 job, filled it. Nice job. They then, they then hired a VP of finance at 170 and I said, why didn't you come to me? Well, we thought you operated at the lower level. But who set that position? I did. You should have sent them to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you must be prepared to walk away in every, every single situation you go to with a client, you look them in the eye and you go, I'm talking to you now, but I'm more than happy to walk away. You start from that position. Because it takes away the desperation then. We were talking off record here, and you said to a client, I need your business. And you kicked yourself as soon as you said it, didn't you? Absolutely. It's the, the worst thing to tell Absolutely. me. Absolutely. <laughs> because now he's thinking, ha ha. <laughs> I got a lot of Yeah, certainly. Yeah. 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 Do you really, right? <laughs> so, yeah. about, um, I often said, and now I wonder if you're wrong, I want your business. As opposed to need. That's a very different word, isn't it? It's a personal thing. I I wouldn't even say I want your business. I, I don't want anybody's business. Yeah, I do say it. Hmm. But I'd like to work with you, but only on my on, yeah. on my time. Hmm. So we, the guy we know, he says I, I'd like to work with you, but I believe in win-win. So if we can work on a win-win, that's happy. But it, however, I will walk away if it's he does this. If it's lose win, I'm never going to be happy with that. And he's implying that if, they, if he thinks the client's going to lose, I'm going to walk away. Mm. Very clever the way he does that. So the client's thinking this guy wants to win-win. Yeah. And by the way, if a client says I don't want win win, walk away anyway. <laughs> yeah? And again, we were talking about this uh, <coughs> a well maintained customer database or potential clients. As we talked on earlier, people have already bought from you 
I'm easier than selling anybody. If you take anything else from this two days, make a list of people that have bought from you and reach out to them in the next 48 hours. Yeah? And we'll, we'll, we'll give you a message to send to them. Reach out to people that have already bought from you. Increase the number of times the client buys from you. Increase the profits. Because you've already paid to acquire that client. All of you guys here in this room, virtually, have got clients that have bought from you. There's a gold mine there. Reach out to them. As I touched on earlier, sorry Brad, I'm not picking you. But the more you're prepared to invest in, 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 in marketing, the more clients uh, you, you're going to win. It's really as simple as that. So Paul, if you say I'm going to spend £10 a month on marketing and I say I'll spend a 1000 it kind of makes sense, isn't it? I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to acquire more clients. I'm going to be in a stronger position to select who I'm going to work with. But you go, oh, I've only got 10 quid to spend and I've got one lead from here. So you're constantly looking. And once you know, and one of the other things you do is obviously work on your LTV. Once you know your lifetime value of your client, you then go, okay. Yes, Paul? Well, I think I'd, the first uh, set of uh, people who already bought Way easier, way easier to sell than a stranger. One of the things I think that has been quite evident with us for LinkedIn this year, um, I mean, it's been around for a while, but where you have a client, say you're lead dealing with a, a president or a general manager or, or whatever, the hiring, you say you haven't spoken to that person for six months, all of a sudden that person leaves that company and goes somewhere else. Historically, I would know, wouldn't know where that person's gone until I speak to him or hear it through the grapevine. But now with LinkedIn, you automatically know that he's gone from client A to potential client B. So you hopefully you've still got the relationships with the client A, you automatically pick up a new client. That's you know right, yeah. saying as far as, so you're yeah. not marketing to a stranger, you're marketing to an old client That's right. in a well, new company. Yeah, well just touching, one of our clients, some of you guys know, Jim Newsom, he, 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 what he does, he does just that. <laughs> But these aren't even people that are bought from him. So he looks all the big, he works within rail and infrastructure, and he looks for all the big movers, CEOs that have moved, and we put together a series of letters and emails to send to them. So he's saying things like, oh, you've just recently joined XYZ, and we just want to wish you all the best, and it's just touching them. But he's picking up, he's worked out, I think it's six, or, sorry, eight touches by email and letter, and he's picking up business from people that he didn't have a relationship with previously. Just he, yeah, because he knows that when they get into that role, they're going to probably do some... Build a team. We, like, yeah. pretty soon, so. we all know that, don't we? It's a good point, isn't it? So, people that are connected, have created, you, or you see people are moving, you should be reaching out to them. Yeah. It's almost inevitable that a senior role, they're going to be building a team. So you want to be the first person they think of when they build a team, because you, you, know, you already know they're going to do it. So you need to make sure that when they do, it's you they choose. I had an interesting one that because I, I, I sort of for everyone who I categorise it. But, um, I used to categorise a lot of clients contact me, and I used to categorise it by contacting my client as where my leaders come from, where they actually come to me instead of me going to them. But I've started now because I put interim managers in. I, I start saying categorise by categorise by not just by client, but by contact by an interim who who I've worked with in the past, but is in a senior position, and I've actually worked out with us three weeks. I've had a lot of leads. Those leads coming from clients are actually coming from interim managers and they're people that I've worked with in the past mm. and I wasn't clued into that at all. Yeah, because so they I trust you. I think it's, and I think it's why, and they trust me because yeah. I've interviewed them all and, and they know how I operate and I've tried, I've either placed them or tried to place them so they know how we work. Mm. And yeah, mm. yeah, I like that. It's yeah. I just Remember we said at the beginning, hidden profits that you're actually sitting on right now? Just the hidden profits that you're sitting on. 